Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Becky Robinson, and I'm so thrilled that you've chosen to join us with Mark Miller as we celebrate the launch of his new book, Win Every Day. Hi, Mark. How are you? Fantastic. Great to be with you. So as you're coming in, what we want to do is give you some technical orientation to today's event, and we invite you to find the chat panel. We would love to engage with you throughout today's event. And what I would ask you to do is to take a moment, tell us how you're doing in the midst of all the craziness in our world this week, and tell us where you're calling in from. We would love to hear from you. So take a moment, use the drop-down menu in our chat panel to select all panelists and attendees, and let us know how you're doing and where you're calling in from. We will get started in just a few moments, but we want to give everyone a chance uh, to get into the meeting. A couple of other notes, we are recording today's event and we will be sharing this recording with you um, so that if you have any colleagues or friends or family who haven't been able to make this call that you could share this link with them later. So welcome in North Carolina, San Diego, South Carolina, Baltimore, Austin, Texas. We're so glad to see all of you joining us today, and we look forward to uh, an incredible conversation with Mark. So I do have the new book here. If you have already gotten the new book, tell us about that in the chat as well. Uh, so this new book by Mark, Win Every Day, Proven Practices for Extraordinary Results, is part of his High Performance uh, Leadership Series. So if you have the book, um, we would love to see that. And welcome to folks calling in from Canada. Uh, an international audience today as always. Um, and thanks to you who have already left reviews for Mark's new book on Amazon. A couple of you are mentioning that and uh, love these comments that this is your best book so far, Mark. I don't know if you'd seen that feedback on Amazon yet. Thank you for that. Sure. Um, so Mark and I were chatting before the call about the title of the new book, Win Every Day. What the title doesn't tell you is that this new book is on the topic of execution. And he and the team at Chick-fil-A did years of study to figure out what it takes to execute with excellence. So as we dive into today's call, we want to start with a poll, and we would love to hear from you about how your organization is at execution. So I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll and give you a few moments to respond. Um, so on a scale of one to five, how would you rate your company's execution? One is execution, what's that? And five is we are performing at our highest level and seeing amazing results. So how effective is your team at execution? Mark, do you have any predictions about uh, how this will turn out? I think there could be a bell curve here. Um, I think there are some organizations that uh, undervalue execution, don't spend enough time and energy thinking about it. And I think there's some amazing organizations in the world, uh, thankfully, because those are the ones that we studied, as you mentioned, for several years. So uh, it should be a pretty normal distribution. All right. Well, I'm going to give you just a couple of more seconds if you would still like to reply. If for some reason you can't see today's poll, we would welcome any comments about your organization's effectiveness in execution in the chat. Um, and I see some questions already coming in. We will incorporate some questions throughout today's call, and we will allow some time at the end of the call to get to some of those questions. So please feel free to add them at any time. Okay, so let's take a look at these results. Uh, it looks like about 54% of you are right in the middle. So your organizations are average at execution. Um, only 3% of you think that your organization is excellent at execution. Um, and it's, so it seems like there may be a lot of learning that we can all do today, Mark. Yes, I think so. Okay, so before we dive in, uh, it seems that many of you are already familiar with Mark, but I would like to take a moment to introduce Mark. Uh, Mark is the Vice President of High Performance Leadership at Chick-fil-A. Uh, he lives in the Atlanta area with his wife, uh, has two sons and three grandkids, adorable ones at that. Um, and as I mentioned before, Mark has written so many books, I don't even know the number at the moment, um, with the latest one in the High Performance series being Win Every Day. Um, so again, welcome, Mark. It's great to be back with you. I enjoyed our last call, and hopefully some of the folks online were with us uh, just a couple weeks ago when I think we set up this series. 
we did. We reviewed all of the other books and moves um, in the high performance series. And so today we are going to hone in on the new book. Um, and now if by chance you missed the last webinar, Kelly, if you wouldn't mind pulling the link to that recording, folks can save that and potentially watch it later to get the context for today. So in the last webinar, Mark, we discussed that all high performance organizations do four things, and the fourth one is Excel at execution. So for those who might um, be have missed the last webinar, maybe we can do a quick overview of the other moves um, and re just remind us and catch us up as we dive into this topic of Excel at execution. Sure, I'll do this really quick. It began with a question we asked over a decade ago, and it was really, what do all high performance organizations have in common? And that launched a multi-year project of, of research and discovery and discussion and debate. And, and we knew there was an answer there, but it was, it was somewhat hard to figure it out and to distill it down to, to its elemental uh, components. But good news, at the end of what turned into about a five-year journey, we discovered that high-performance organizations really have four things in common. They bet on leadership. They act as one, which is about alignment. They win the heart, which is about engagement, and they excel at execution. And so what we've done since then is a series of books that represent a deep dive into each of those moves. We describe them all in a book we call Chestnut Checkers, but it was, it was really a 50,000 foot flyby. And so uh, as we've unpacked this content, we decided that this was the year to talk about execution. We actually started this focused research about three years ago saying, okay, we learned broadly and generically that execution is essential to high performance, but how do these organizations pull it off? And that's, that's what this book's about. So Mark, I did see a question come in um, already from Josie, who was wondering if you could highlight a couple of the companies that you researched and in putting this book together. Yes, it was a who's who. Um, so let me just mention a few. We, we spent time with some of the usual suspects, the Navy SEALs, Apple, Starbucks, uh, Cirque du Soleil, the Mayo Clinic, Southwest Airlines. Uh, and then there were other organizations that are less known, but really good at execution. An organization, a global organization called Danaher, we learned a lot from them. And so, uh, I think 16, 18 organizations uh, and counting. Oh, let me mention a couple of them that were fun was time with the Clemson uh, men's football program, Clemson University. I got to spend time with a member of the staff from the Seattle Seahawks. And so um, it's, it's been a very, very fun journey over the last really three years. That sounds incredible. So um, as we dive in to talking more about this topic, Mark, can you tell us what you mean when you say Excel at execution? Well, that's a really straightforward question. And, and the answer is a little bit elusive, uh, only because it varies from business to business and from organization to organization. If you're a football team, execution means something different than if you're a teacher in the classroom or if you're in a manufacturing facility. So everyone listening to this, you need to contextualize uh, what I'm about to say. But it is the demonstrated ability to consistently deliver as promised, whether that be product, services, uh, job, le job level tasks and activities. Uh, can you with confidence repeat over and over and over again the desired behaviors and create the desired outcomes. Uh, we saw in the poll you just did, most organizations can't. I think uh, the, the quick poll we did here said 3%. I think, I think that number is generous when you think about organizations at large. We've got an accelerated group obviously on the line here today. But I would not say that 3% of the organizations in the world excel at execution. I think it's far fewer than that. Well, so Mark, you know, sit here with me for a minute, because I think almost every leader of almost every team would aspire to excellence in execution. And so if, if many of us, most of us, all of us have this deeply held desire to execute well, why does it seem that elite level execution is so elusive to most organizations? Well, I want to I challenge um, 
your assumption. I've met 10,000 people that want to write a book. Do they really? I mean, do they really? I've, I've met hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that say they want to run a marathon. Do they really? I know you've run a lot. We may, I may use that example a little bit later. So first, to say that you want to excel at execution, it's easy to say that, and it's actually the right thing to say if you're a leader, but really, do you really want it? Now, let's assume, let's give the leaders on this uh, webinar the benefit of the doubt and say they're in that camp. Mm -hmm. Well, for those that really want it, then you got to have a plan. You got to have a credible plan. So when you decided to run your first marathon, I know you've run many, when I decided to run my first marathon, we had to make a decision that we really wanted to do it. Not, it would be nice, it would be fun, maybe someday, it's an aspiration, it's on a dream list, it's on a bucket list. No, when you decide you really are going to do it, I'm guessing you put together a plan and you started working that plan. And, mm -hmm. and that's one thing I believe this book can do. It can, it can add value to leaders who have made that decision because none of this is gonna happen without a decision. But once you've made a real decision, then Win Every Day can provide the playbook that you need to actually uh, turn that vision into reality and sustain it. So that's really helpful, Mark. Um, I want to just summarize what I heard you say. Maybe uh, my assumption is partially correct that leaders want to excel at execution, but it starts with the decision to excel at execution and then it requires a plan and following the plan in order to become excellent a real decision and, and you actually have to decide how good you want to be right? mm. and what are you comparing yourself against there are many businesses that are successful that don't excel at execution so one they could be successful because they're better than their competition doesn't mean they're excelling at execution or they're good but they're not great you know, one of the phrases we use in the book and, and one of the um, rallying cries that some organizations have already embraced is do the right thing the right way every time. Now, if you can create a culture where people are striving to do the right thing the right way every time, that's a really, really high bar. Now, quickly, before you ask the question, I'm going to tell you the question that I've already heard many times as we've talked about this content people will immediately say, well, that's an unrealistic expectation. Hmm. And I will say, I agree completely. It's not the expectation, it's the goal. And what we know from our own experiences and from the psychologists who've helped inform this work, they've said that lofty goals inspire people, whereas unrealistic expectations create disengagement. So as leaders, I think if we can say, we wanna create a culture where we are striving, we are working together, we are tr trying to do the right thing the right way every time. And as leaders, our role is to help you, to help you pursue that level of execution. You can change a culture uh, in phenomenal ways. So that's powerful, and I hope folks are catching it, that distinction between a goal and an expectation. And goals can inspire people to strive to reach them, whereas expectations can be demotivating and lead people to disengagement. So Mark, can we talk for a moment about some common mis misconceptions that leaders might have about execution? Yeah, let me, let me share a few. Uh, and we might want to hear from the audience what they believe some of these misconceptions are. Uh, I think that some people believe that it is just out of reach, particularly when I, I throw something out there like do the right thing the right way every time. They'll just say it, it's impossible. Okay, great. You know, how, how low do you want to set the bar? But some would say to excel at execution is impossible. Others would say my workforce won't go there. Well, okay, so there's either a leadership issue or a workforce issue and, and they go hand in hand, right? I mean, um, what, what have you established as the culture of your expectations and who are the men and women that you've invited to join you on the journey? Uh, in some of our pilot, we piloted this content in 70 of our Chick-fil-A restaurants and we literally had some of our uh, restaurant operators 
who made the decision to dismiss people who didn't want to strive for the levels of execution that we're talking about. We had others that changed their selection criteria because they said, I've got to have people who are willing to pursue a lofty goal. And, and so, so is there a leadership issue? Are there, are there team member issues? But generally, it's not out of the hands of the leader. And I think that's one misconception. Another misconception is many leaders think it's not worth the energy and the effort. And I would say, again, I've already referenced, you can be successful without excelling at execution to the levels we're talking about. But what are the implications for your brand? What are the implications for your profit and loss statement? You know, how much time and energy and effort are you spending on rework? How much are you spending on waste? What is the cost of turnover? What is the cost of lost customers? What is the cost of a brand that is known not for excellence, but, but for mediocrity? Um, I, think, I think customers will give you grace for a, for a time, but how often can you mess up the product or service that you're delivering before they're going to be uh, willing to switch to one of your competitors? So I think the misconceptions are, um, are plentiful, and, and I can't find many, I don't know that I found any, that is grounded in truth. So we would invite you if you have any additional misconceptions that you think leaders might have about execution to go ahead and put those in the chat. I don't see any yet, uh, but those might be interesting to return to. Let me give you one more. And I don't hear it as often, but I hear people say that it costs too much. And back to those examples I just cited, to excel at execution actually costs less. Forget the, the uh, top line gains that you can have from being a brand and an organization with a, with a reputation for excellence, but you eliminate waste, you um, reduce turnover, you, know, you, you, you do those things that actually do contribute to the, to the top line and the bottom line. So um, cost is often cited as a, uh, a deterrent, and I think that's a misconception. Thanks for that, Mark. Um, so thinking again about the research that you did for the book, I'm curious what you think about, you know, some common management techniques and problem solving frameworks like Six Sigma, Agile, uh, Lean, getting things done. What, what place do those have in helping organizations achieve excellence? Okay, well, that's quite a fruit basket of things. <laughs> it sure is. Uh, they probably have different uh, tools. Uh, those different tools and approaches and frameworks have different places on the journey. Um, so, again, I could probably take them one by one, but let me, let me say generically, um, individual leaders need tools to help with their personal effectiveness. Organizations need strategies and tools for problem solving. And so I think those and others could be quite useful. I think you've got to use some judgment. You've got to use some discernment. Uh, I had the privilege to start our quality group at Chick-fil-A 100 years ago, and that when uh, Six Sigma was all the rage. I mean, it's still out there, but it was really in the 80s, uh, total quality management and Six Sigma was all the rage. And we chose not to use that particular methodology, and some people questioned that decision. And I said, well, we're working with high school kids with high turnover, irregular schedules. I said, although that approach is valid in many situations, we sell chicken. And so we chose other ways to focus on quality improvement. So I think the leader has to use judgment regarding which tools, which frameworks, which practices are culturally relevant for them. But uh, each and every one of the things you mentioned can add value in an organization, but are they part of a bigger plan, right? A lot of organizations are guilty of what I call random acts of training. And uh, let's use execution as an example. Some organizations want to execute, but independent of which tool or resource they choose, they either can't get traction or they can't sustain it. Well, that goes back to the first thing we talked about. Are they well led? Are their people aligned? And are their people engaged? because those are those three moves that enable you to excel at execution. So, so be careful anytime you pick a tool or a strategy or a technique, are you applying it in context? That's, that's a big problem for a lot of organizations. 
That's super helpful, Mark. So it occurs to me that we've been talking an awful lot about leaders. Uh, obviously, that's logical because you, you work with leaders. But I'm curious, Mark, are leaders really the only ones who have to worry about execution? Um, and how can we help execution to matter to every member of our organization? Um, and if we see that people in our organization don't care about execution, how can we get everyone on board? Okay, so let's- A lot of questions. There were several questions there. So let's start with the first. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna paraphrase it back. Is execution the, the focus, the domain, and the priority of the leader alone? I would say absolutely not if you want to create a culture where uh, excellence is the norm. Leaders can't do this by themselves because leaders don't do the frontline work. In our context, they don't serve the guests. They don't clean the tables. They don't make the sandwiches. They don't run the drive through um, we, have, we have learned, and this may be a blinding flash of the obvious to everybody on, online here today, the magic is in the masses. So let me, let me give you a simple example. Uh, and for the, those that have looked at the book know that uh, we've chosen a sports metaphor to, to tell this story, but it seems to work so well for me. That's like saying for a football team, can just the coach care about execution? Well, the coach is not the one on the field. The coach isn't the one running the play. The coach may call the play, but you need every member of the team to make their individual block to execute their assignment. You need the, the wide receivers to run the correct route. You need the quarterback to turn the right way and the back to turn the right way. And, and you, know, you need to block down or pull the guard. And, and that's why it works. It's not because the leader, the coach, had a great idea and may have designed and called a great play. A great play means nothing if you can't execute it and you can't execute it without individual players. So to your, to your first question, the, the levels of execution we're aspiring to can only be achieved if you get everyone involved. Now, I think the second question was, well, what if you have some people that don't care about execution? So I referenced that earlier. You may have a misfit, but I would not jump to that conclusion. I would want people to understand why execution matters. Why does it matter to them personally? even as a human being, right? Why, why is it a good thing to bring your best self to the task at hand? I would want them to understand the impact on their team. I would want them to understand the impact on the organization. And even broader than that, a growing number of organizations are trying to actually do good in the world. And all of that begins at the point of execution, right? That's, that's how you are able to do good in the world, that those individual acts, cumulative over time, create an opportunity for influence. You earn that influence at the point of execution over and over and over again. So if you don't have people who are on board, I would, I would try to help them get there. Now, I reference this. I'll say it again. You may actually want to tweak your selection criteria because there is a subset of human beings that really don't care about this kind of thing. I'm not saying they're bad people, but if you're a coach, do you really want somebody on your team that says, I don't care what play you call, but I'm going to do what I want to do? Doesn't even mean they're a bad person. But if you're going to play this game, you need people who are going to play that game with you. And then Certainly I, so. Third and finally, your last question was about how do we help them get there? I've referenced some of that, but I think part of it is leadership intent. Like, no, leaders have to communicate that this is actually the way we're going to do this. And, and we're going to help you, and we're going to, we're going to coach you, and we're going to train you, and we're going to celebrate you, and we're going to hold you accountable. And you help people get there by knowing this is not a flavor of the month. This is, this is the way this business is going to operate. This organization is going to operate. This is the way this team is going to uh, pursue our work. And I think that'll help some people get on board. I heard a talk recently from a CEO uh, took over a new team, and his intent was not to uh, dismiss anyone. He wanted to work with the team that he had, and someone actually confronted him that they did not want to do what he wanted to do. And he said, well, that's fine. I said, what do you mean that's fine? He said, well, we'll, we'll miss you. We'll still love you, but we'll miss you. Hmm. Like, you're not going to dictate the play we're going to run here. 
can you, I'll give you to Lamar to decide if you want to run this play or not. And the guy said, well, I can tell you now, I don't want to do it. He says, well, that's fine. That's fine. Leaders have to have the courage to have those kind of conversations. Who's calling the play? And, and you can help people. Many, in fact, that leader talked that a decade later, he had only lost a couple of leaders over a decade because most everyone stayed on the senior leadership team. Um, he, he won them over, but he told them, here's what we're going to do and here's how we're going to do it. Wow. So Rob has a really insightful question that references uh, something from the book, Mark, uh, when the book says, are we good enough? So how do you get everyone, not just the leaders, to think we aren't yet? So what do you do when people's idea of good or excellent doesn't measure up to what the organization is aspiring to? Well, I think it, it goes back to, to what I just said. The leader has to decide that for the organization. Now, I'm all about uh, consensus when, when appropriate. I'm, I'm all about including people uh, when appropriate. But this is a strategic leadership decision. And I think ultimately the leader has to decide how good are we going to become? What are our aspirations? You, you know, you're, you're not uh, having that problem at somewhere like Clemson football. And Dabo says, no, we're, this is how good we're going to be. And that's what we work towards. That's our goal. And so um, if you work for a leader that thinks it's good enough, then you've got to decide, can you um, excel at execution in the area of your responsibility or accountability? And if you have, um, grander aspirations, you may actually not be at the right organization because, you know, you're, you're going to probably struggle if, if you want to be better than the leader you're serving. That's really helpful. So, Mark, what are the specific behaviors that are needed to create and sustain a plan of excellent execution? Okay, well, this is the fun part for me. Um, I mentioned we piloted this content with 70 of our businesses, and the first... 40, we had messaged this content differently, still built on the same truth that has ultimately made its way into the book. And what we did in the last pilot with 30 of our organ, uh, organizations is we've reframed the content to your specific question. We said, this is not just for leaders. I've already said the magic is in the masses. So what are the behaviors that we want everyone in the organization, leaders included, what are the behaviors we want everyone in the organization to embrace? And we have distilled it down to three. The first is to pursue mastery. And I don't know, I don't want to go deep on these, but let me give you a word about that. Uh, this was inspired by a lot of personal examples and illustrations and organizational examples. I mean, this was one of those, uh, as uh, I've been told before, if you stare at the stars long enough, patterns will begin to emerge. We didn't find a single organization that used this language, but the elite organizations embodied this. And what it boils down to is you can't reach the levels of excellence we're aspiring to unless individuals make a decision. It was actually the sports psychologist for Clemson University that kind of nailed it for me. He said, you can't drift to where you're trying to go. Individuals must make a choice that I want to go there. And so we uh, have chosen the phrase pursue mastery. And we say mastery is a, is a level of skill when the desired behavior is done consistently, flawlessly, and it becomes second nature. So it's just routine. In our world, we talk about the core four. We want these are the behaviors that we want you to experience when you're with one of our frontline people, right? They're gonna make eye contact, they're gonna share a smile, they're gonna speak enthusiastically, and they're gonna say, My pleasure. Well, when you reach mastery of the core four, it's when those things are done consistently. It's when uh, they're done flawlessly. You don't do three or you don't do two, which when you do all four. And when it's second nature, when you don't even have to think about it, that would be mastery of the core four. And so we think uh, the cornerstone of this whole play is for individuals to say, yep, I will strive. 
I will pursue masters. The second is own the numbers. This was probably, again, I hesitate to, to label things that we don't have data to support, but, but I would say this was universally true. This was even true in some of the second and third tier organizations that we studied. If they have any level of seriousness about execution, they think about measurement and they measure because that helps you identify where you're winning, that helps you identify where you need to improve, that gives you opportunities to celebrate. I and mean, there are a lot of things that come from measurement. It helps you create focus, it helps create energy, it helps create urgency. And we saw example after example after example after example. And we came to the conclusion that as powerful as measurement is, and there's some psychological data to support this as well, what's one step more powerful than measurement it's when individuals own the numbers. It's when I say, okay, I am going to own that. I am going to work to make it better. I'm going to identify the individual and personal characteristics and behaviors that will drive that number. And I am going to uh, adopt a sense of personal accountability towards that number. So it's still built on a foundation of measurement. Measurement is probably the core idea here, but in these very best organizations, it's not someone else imposing a number, is it as much as it is an individual owning that number? And uh, that's, been, that's been a game changer. Uh, in some of our pilot restaurants, they would tell you that was, that was the big deal for them because honestly, uh, they had a lot of their team members that didn't even know the score. Well, there's obviously no way you can own a number that you don't even know. And I would, I would suggest that you got people working in organizations all over the world right now, this minute, that have no idea what the score is. And when you don't know what the score is, you don't know what numbers matter, you don't know how your performance impacts those numbers, uh, it, it's impossible to execute consistently over time at the levels we're discussing. So Mark, I'm curious hearing you talk about that um, and that if you don't know the numbers that you're working toward, it's impossible to have those as your goals. Would you be willing to share with us some of the numbers that the restaurants are using and, and helping people to own? Well, I can. I wanna offer the disclaimer that uh, every team sets its own numbers and every player sets its own numbers. So, uh, and, and let me also say, I don't wanna to go too deep here, but sometimes the numbers are uh, set by the organization and sometimes they're set by the team, and sometimes they're set by the individual, and sometimes they're a combination of the three. So, you know, you, you've got to think about, it's often it's a scorecard. Now, in our restaurant situation, I've already mentioned a lot of uh, part-time workers, a lot of young people, high turnover. We have continued to encourage our operators who make these decisions, by the way, independently. They're independent business people, but they're trying to, in many, 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 many cases, keep it simple. And as someone moves higher in the organization, they may have a more expanded scorecard. But it could be as simple as uh, how'd you do on the core four? Uh, how consistently are you doing that? It could be order accuracy for the person that's bagging because we have reports on how accurate the customers tell us, you know, was my order correct? Um, you can have speed numbers through a drive through or on a transaction count. You can have waste numbers in the kitchen. I mean, any number of things that a person can assume responsibility for and say, I'm gonna own this number and I'm personally gonna to work to make this number better. Thank you, I appreciate that, Mark. I, it's helpful. Pursue mastery, own the numbers. And one more. Help others win. Now, this one is deceivingly simple and I would argue deceivingly powerful. This one caught us by surprise because again, this wasn't something that you can go to uh, the handbook of Southwest Airlines or somewhere else and say, yeah, it says right here that we're supposed to help others win. But this was one of those things that emerged and I, I hesitate to call it an insight, but it was, it, it was a, a breakthrough moment for us because if you, if you look at pursue mastery, it's critical. That's that individual decision. And you look at own the numbers, that's still about me and my ownership of something. And those are good, powerful, necessary elements. But when you combine that with this idea that every person says, it is part of my job, it is part of my role, it is part of my responsibility to help others win, then you've moved from me to we. 
and you've actually not moved, you've combined those. Those first two are more about me and this one's about we. And we, we had an app that we're using in our restaurants as part of this. And uh, it asked three questions at the end of every shift. The third question is, who did you, or how did you help someone on your team win today? Simple open-ended question. In 90 days, in 30 restaurants, we had about 40,000 examples. We, and you may think, well, well, why weren't they doing this before? Well, I'm assuming some of this was going on before, but we had never been so direct. We'd never been so overt. We'd never been so specific. No, part of your job, part of your role is to help others win. Mm -hmm. And they were giving us all kind of ideas. And it's around coaching. It's around celebration. It's around correction. It's around accountability. It's around training. It's about physical help. Said, uh, one team member said, I noticed the person next to me. I didn't have anybody at my register. And when I heard the drink order, I went ahead and got it for the person next to me. I thought I could help them win. And that would be a win for the customer too. I mean, it could be that tactical, but tens of thousands of those, and this is in 30 restaurants in just a few months. Mm -hmm. So we saw such a huge cultural transformation. And I would argue in places where we already had good cultures. Mm -hmm. But now all of a sudden they, they, they expanded their, their, their view. They expanded their idea of even what it meant means to come to work. One quick story. I had a lady tell me that this win every day uh, concept had changed her life and which is of course exciting. And, and I want to learn more. And so we began to have a conversation and she said, and I think totally differently about work. Now I said, a, a, a woman, this young lady, this was, she was probably 18, 19 years old, you know, just a kid. Mm -hmm. she said, this has changed the way I think about work forever. And I went, really? I said, well, that, I guess that's good. Cause she was kind of excited about it. I said, can you give me an example? She said, I walk in here every day trying to figure out how I can help other people. And I said, okay, can, can you tell me why you do that? She said, have you heard about this app we've got? <laughs> she said, They're going to ask me every day. And so I want to have something. And she said, it's just changed the way I look at work. It's changed the way I look at my teammates. It's like, mm. this is so much. It, it, she was struggling for the language. She was saying, this is so much more fulfilling. It's like, I'm actually trying to serve people on both sides of the counter. And so if you can imagine the power of getting the 10 people on your team or the hundred people in your organization or the hundred thousand people in your organization to say part of my job every day is to help others win. So we have been blown away by the power that that has unleashed. In addition to these same people saying, I will make a personal commitment to pursue mastery and I will own the numbers that I can affect and the numbers that I can impact. And I'm going to help everybody else win too. So those are the three uh, fundamentals, we call them, the three fundamentals of execution. Well, it's so powerful, Mark. And I'm just sit sitting here wondering and thinking if others who are listening um, are imagining what their workplaces might be like if everyone came to work with the attitude of how can I help others win. Um, and I'm curious also about how that ties back to execution. So um, what thoughts do you have? You know, can you connect the dots for me? So how does helping others win help the whole organization excel at execution? Well, you go all the way back to if, if you have bought into this idea that I'm going to try to do the right thing the right way every time, and I'm going to help you win, and you're not doing the right thing the right way every time, I'm going to coach you. I'm going to train you. I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to help you because this is all in the confines of execution. I'm not saying I won't walk your dog, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about in the context of the workplace, knowing that we're trying to win every day, we're trying to excel at execution. How can you help others experience that win? Uh, when you're struggling with your numbers, I may be able to help you. When you're struggling, just having a bad day, I may be able to encourage you, which helps engagement, which ultimately helps execution, right? If people don't care, they're certainly not going to excel at execution. So uh, I think it, it begins to change the ethos and the culture where everybody is concerned about the goals and aspirations of the organization and everyone is looking beyond themselves to make a contribution. 
That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, so Mark, what would be one, your number one piece of advice for organizations that struggle to execute well? Well, I, I probably showed my hand a little bit earlier. I would say the leaders have to decide. I mean, just not, it's a hope, it's a dream, it's an aspiration, it's on my bucket list. So I want to, I would even say, I want to build a high performance organization. And the ultimate uh, hallmark, the, the trademark, the, the pinnacle of a high performance organization is you excel at execution. So I think a leader has to decide. This is a strategic leadership decision. I've never seen an organization drift to the levels of excellence that we're, um, that we're discussing here today. So the leader has to decide, then you've got to get a plan. You, you've, got, you've got to have a credible plan and focusing exclusively on execution will never be sustainable. Now you can drive some short-term gains, it will never be sustainable. I've told this story before on a webinar a couple of years ago, when we began to talk about bet on leadership, act as one, win the heart, and excel at execution, I literally had a leader tell me that all he cared about was execution. He didn't care about all that other crap. Well, I said, okay, so good luck with that. I said, think about a gymnast that says, I just want to do the dismount. It's like, where do you get the height, the energy, and momentum to do the dismount. It's in the routine that precedes the dismount. So where do you get the height, the energy, and the momentum to excel at execution? It's in the routine that precedes the dismount. Is your organization well-led? Are they aligned? And are your people engaged? Do they really care? Then you're positioned to ask people, will you pursue mastery? Will you own the numbers? And will you help others win? Some people that struggle, it's because they're trying to race to the finish line and they've not run the race so but well, it's, back to your advice it starts yeah, yeah. With the decision it starts leader, with the decision bill belichick didn't wake up one day and find out he had a great football program he made a decision he was going to build a great football program and he's been working on it for how long 30 years 35 years sure well and you know it's interesting mark to think about kind of the i don't know if it's like arrogance that says skip over that other stuff we just want to execute well but if i told you well i just want to cross the finish line at my marathon i don't really care about the training or the miles to get to the finish line all i care about is the finish line it's impossible to get there right maybe you've got a business idea there you can just take people's picture standing at the finish <laughs> line. uh it's the pretenders club we can I, douse I them with water so they look really sweaty sweaty um but yeah, you got you to gotta do the work. Have I, I told you about my very first run of when I was training for my very first marathon. I don't I, think so. I think I, you should I, share. I decided I was going to run. My son, uh, my oldest son actually challenged me. He challenges me to do something every year that's kind of crazy. And a few years ago, he said, hey, let's run a marathon. And so I said, okay. So I thought an assessment would be appropriate. I said, I'm going to go out and just run and kind of do a personal checkup, like how, how did I feel? How far did I go? How long did it take? And I want you to know that on my very first run, I made it four. Four minutes? Four, no, not four miles, <laughs> I made it four minutes. And it, it took six months to go from four minutes to 26.2 miles, but. That's pretty fast. You gotta start, right? You gotta start mm -hmm. and uh, that start, starts with a decision. That, that start was preceded with a decision. Mm -hmm. And I was in an awful spot, but then you, you, you put in the time, you put in the energy, you know better than I do because you run so many. Uh, and you put, in the, you put in the hours, you put in the training, and you, you have to, at least for me, I have to remind myself of the decision or I'm, I'm not going to get up and run. I'm not going to do the hard work. Well, certainly so. Organizations that jump into this, they're going to have to, they're going to have to be firmly committed to becoming a high performance organization or they won't get there. Well, and hopefully some of these analogies will help these ideas stick. You have to decide. So Mark, I'm imagining there are some people on this call who feel like excellent execution is outside of their control or influence because they are not the leaders. So if we are not the leaders, if we don't have any positional authority to, you know, start an initiative to improve execution in our organizations, what advice do you have for us? Start with yourself. 
start with yourself. You know, are you willing to make a commitment to pursue mastery on, on the things that you do control? Are you ready to make a commitment to own the numbers? Not, not numbers that are totally out of your control, maybe not even numbers that are out of your influence, but numbers that you affect, numbers that you control, numbers that you contribute to in a significant way. You say, well, I don't have anything that I totally own, but you're contributing to something or I don't know why you're on the payroll. So why don't you figure out a way to increase your engagement with those numbers? Even if you don't own them totally, you can act like an owner. What if those were your numbers? What would you do? How would you try and influence? And then are you ready to make a personal commitment to help others win? I think you'd be shocked at what would happen in your world. And that's one of the unintended uh, consequences that we've seen from this work. We've had many people who've learned these principles and practices and have taken them outside of work. We've got uh, one team member in a restaurant that is using them to coach a local basketball team. We've got people who've used it to improve their own health uh, and a growing list of testimonials about these, these principles and practices will not only transform a business, they can transform your life. So don't, don't get hung up on you're not the leader. I mean, leadership is influence. And you can have a huge amount of influence if you'll, if you'll commit to and practice these fundamentals in your life. That's super helpful. Um, so what if we are the leaders on the call? So, you know, I lead an organization. I imagine there are some other leaders here. Um, where would you recommend that someone like I could start um, to improve execution in my organization? Well, I think, I think we're going to talk about decisions again. <laughs> start with a decision. You're going to mm. say yes. You know, and we talk about this in the book. It's like, how good do we want to be? And I would argue you want to be as good as you can be, but not, but how good you can become is, has actually very little bearing on how good you are today. Back to my run example. Cause if I just said, okay, based on this first run, I guess that tells me I can never run a marathon. Now that just tells you where you are in the moment. You know, there's, there's actually no value in an assessment. The value is in your response to the assessment. It's the response to the assessment. It only tells you where you are at a moment in time. So I would say a leader needs to make the decision. And then beyond that, you need to put together a plan. And you've got a lot of smart people around you. You can build your own, or you can look at some of the resources we've created. Chestnut Checkers is a blueprint for a high performance organization. And we've got supporting resources. Uh, if you feel like your organization is well led, they're aligned, the people are engaged, then check out Win Every Day. It, it actually unpacks not only the things we've talked about today, we begin to share in the book some leadership practices that will actually accelerate the journey. And so uh, create a plan, buy a plan, borrow a plan, um, make a decision, and then get a plan, and then go to work. That's really helpful. So Mark, I have a lot of questions that have been coming into chat, and uh, thankfully we have a few minutes to address some of them, um, and some of them directly relate to what you just said. So Greg is wondering, Mark, if you've developed or seen an integrated solution that captures your best ideas on engagement and execution so they can be implemented. I think you might have already just referenced that resource. Yes, I think, I think the integration is the, the chestnut checkers um, work where we, we lay out the blueprint for these four, uh, these four moves. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, Greg, hopefully that's helpful. Well, let me say, there, there's also um, a field guide to support that. There, there are uh, quick start guides for frontline leaders. There's an assessment. There's a video series. I mean, there are other resources that uh, can help you potentially. Thank you, Mark. Um, so I'm wondering, Mark, do, did you find that pursuing mastery ever gets in the way of execution? This is a question from my friend, Nathan. Um, so for example, perfectionism and how should teams decide how masterful they need to be? Wow, okay, that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> so, and by the way, it's, it's not a question I've had before. So let me, let me see how I would wanna respond succinctly. That's a very big question. I think perfectionism is not what we're talking about. We're talking about an aspiration to provide your personal best in 
each and every situation. And there are many circumstances and there are many factors that may impact that. If you're gonna do a presentation, you know, the longer you practice, theoretically, the better that would get. But if your boss comes in today and says you're doing a presentation tomorrow, I think you're gonna do the very best you can within the constraints and the confines that you have. So this is not a call for perfectionism. It is a call for very lofty goals that, that anchor your attitude, that anchor your behavior. Uh, I will say this, one of the leadership practices we look at and, and recommend is that you focus on process. So if you're not getting the outcome you want, I, I say not to pursue it with a perfectionist uh, mindset, but to pursue it with a process mindset, because as, as I think you would agree, the process determines the outcome. And so if you're doing, use my example of a talk, and it's just not that good, and you say, well, I can't deliver it because it's not perfect. Well, okay, if you want it to be better, then you need to go back to the process, and you need to say, okay, how can I do this differently? Because if you want a different outcome, most often you have to change the process. So try not to, to, um, to fixate on the outcome as much as you will focus on the process, and I think that'll help uh, eliminate or at least minimize some of that tension because you don't you don't want to cross that line where it goes from striving for a goal to a perfectionist mindset because I actually don't think that's healthy. Sure so Nathan I hope that helped and if you have any clarification that you're looking for um, feel free to put that in the chat. So here's a question from Luis he's wondering in an organization with high turnover how do you maintain on long-term the culture to excellence in execution and how do you keep people engaged? All right, Luis, we're, we're trying to help our restaurants figure that out because we have relatively high turnover. It's lower than the industry, but it's still relatively high turnover. And here are some best practices. You'll, you know, when you figure this out, let me know. <clears throat> but one, it needs to be part of recruiting, selection, and onboarding. So you're, you're bringing people along from the beginning. You're actually bringing in people who want to be part of this type of culture. And then in their onboarding, in their initial training, you're reviewing, here are, the, here are the plays we run. Here's the strategy that we employ. I mean, this shouldn't be a surprise to them at this point because they've been through your, um, your selection process and your onboarding. And then one of the leadership practices that we talk about and, and this one is huge because I think there's a direct correlation to how well you excel at execution to how well leaders do this one specific behavior. We call it communicate tirelessly. And what we're, what we're referencing here is not general or generic communication. It is communication about the importance and priority of execution. And so when you have a culture that is characterized by those processes that I just mentioned, recruiting, selection, onboarding, and training, and then leaders come and spend a lot of time talking about execution, celebrating people who execute well. Uh, that creates a sustaining energy for the culture. If leaders stop talking about execution and pick up something else as their predominant message, then I would predict that execution will wane over time because people take their cues from leaders. So Mark, this is gonna be a little bit of a strange question, but I was wondering as I was listening to you talking about executing with excellence, whether this idea of executing well applies to the relationships in our organization as well as the technical delivery of our work. So I think about cultures potentially where things like gossip or backbiting or drama is occurring. Well, if that's happening, then we're not aspiring to bring our best selves to our work every day and we're degrading uh, the experience of the people in our organization. So do you think that these concepts of executing with excellence can be applied to relationships? Yeah, I don't. I don't know the answer fully, but I can speak to help others win. If you're committed to helping others win, that should minimize or eliminate the behaviors you just described. Mm -hmm. I would then say leaders, are, one of our responsibilities is, is to protect the culture. And so if you've got a culture where you're asking people to commit to help others win and you witness that type of behavior, leaders have to call it out. I mean, that is not healthy. That is not nurturing. 
That is not uh, creating the, the type of culture that any of us have agreed we want. So I can't in the moment speak to the other fundamentals, but what you described is incongruent with a culture where folks are trying to help each other win. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate that. So we are coming toward the end of our time together. Uh, the good news is we will be back together for one more webinar um, as we celebrate the launch of Mark's latest book, Win Every Day. Um, and Kelly is going to put information about how you can sign up for that next event into the chat, along with a few other key calls to action. So Mark has mentioned a number of resources that exist for all the books in the High Performance Leadership Series. And, you know, just a quick plug. I adore the work that Mark and his team have done around the quick start guides. As a leader, you can very quickly pick up and find practical tips in those tiny books, um, and they're hugely beneficial. Uh, the one that stands out to me is um, the one about engagement and <laughs> the title, no. Win the Heart. So the Win the Heart Quick Start Guide has so many practical ideas of how to really care for people on your team and demonstrate that uh, value that helps people to feel engaged. Um, so I would encourage you to check out all the resources for all of Mark's books on his website, leadeveryday.com is where you can purchase those resources. Uh, Kelly also um, has given you the link uh, to buy Mark's book on Amazon. Uh, it's no lo longer in pre-order status. And we would love to have you also if you have read the book and enjoyed the book to leave a review i personally am so thrilled mark the last i checked we had 57 reviews this first week and i i'm sure that many of the people on the call today are responsible for some of those reviews and the momentum that we're seeing so thank you to all of you for that um, before we wrap up today's call mark i know you have some final words of encouragement for the folks who have joined us today yes thank you becky and thanks for um leading this conversation. I'm always delighted to spend time with you and your team. But I do want to offer a final word. I was with a group of leaders yesterday, and we were talking about win every day. And we were talking, as we have here, largely about the nuts and bolts of how do you do this? How do you, how do you create this type of culture? And I think that's a conversation that is needed. But at the end of that meeting. It was a multi-day meeting, but at the end of that meeting, I said, look, I want to I wanna bring us back to something that I don't know we talk about enough. I said, what is the win in win every day? And I think we're quick to go to the business benefits, and we've seen lower turnover and higher productivity and higher levels of execution tied to higher levels of satisfaction, which of course all ultimately impacts the profit and loss statement. We tend to talk about the business win, and there is clearly a business win. But that is a very, very narrow perspective. I would argue that there is a potential huge potential win for individual members of your team, whether it be increased self-esteem, increased self-confidence as they lift their goals, they lift their aspirations, they discover uh, untapped potential that resides within them. When they have maybe for some, for some a first experience with high levels of personal accountability. When they say, I'm gonna own that number and here's what that means and here's how that translates in my life. And as you introduce some of them for the first time to this idea, we really do want you to help others win. You introduce them to the joy of serving others. I think that's life changing and the ripple effect will go for decades if not generations. So I think they're the personal win at the team member level. I think there's the leadership win. We've had leaders across our country say, this makes my job easier. This creates more capacity for me. This creates more margin for me. I remember meeting with one young leader. He said, I feel guilty. I said, well, why do you feel guilty? He said, we've really deputized our whole team to do stuff that I used to see as my job. I used to tell people to work harder and work smarter and do it better. And I used to be the one always talking about the numbers. And I was the one always trying to get, go help that person, go help that person. He said, we've now deputized all these people. He said, I feel guilty. My job is easier. Hmm. And if you do create that margin and capacity, you know, think of the value you could add as a leader if you actually had a little margin and a little capacity. So I think there's the individual win. I think there's the, the, 
the leader win. I think this is the business win I've already referenced. How about the brand win? If you become a brand known for excelling at execution, I mean, would your organization be listed right now among anybody's list of elite organizations when it comes to execution? What would happen if you did? What would happen if you did? So for some of you, you can even tie it to a higher purpose. You know, why does your organization exist and how, how would you benefit as an organization? How much closer would you move towards your purpose if you built an organization that could win every day? So I reminded our people, this is work that matters. And yes, it has a business outcome and it has a payout. It has a tremendous financial return, but it's so much bigger than that. Because when we help people win every day, we win every day. Then the world wins every day. And, and I love changing the world. I think that's what leaders are supposed to do. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll see you on the next webinar. And uh, wow, I'm inspired, Mark. Take care, everyone. Stay healthy and safe. Bye-bye.